Thank you all for coming. Let's play a game of cat and mouse. In the office security settings, using signed documents, VBA, DLL, and XLL hijacks. My name is Dima van der Waal. I'm a red teamer and offensive developer at Outflank. So I really enjoy building stuff that will then break other stuff and then using that in operations. Some of it will be blurred, not everything will be there. But we will show you the concepts, we will tell you where you can look at stuff, you will just not out to demonstrate exactly stuff like that. And with this, we hope that your teams get better at understanding security settings, understanding what they should sign, what they shouldn't sign, and whether that means it's just a lot of fun they can apply in their own team. So let's start first with the naive approach of me trying to harden the hell out of my office computer. So, the first thing you would do is you would start by mandating code sign. So, you configure office saying, well, I want to disable VBA macros, except if they're going to be signed. And in my setup, I don't add a custom publisher, but in a typical corporate, they will say, well, that will default sign for what, what's ours, and we will add that as a custom publisher. With this setting, you are actually doing very limited value. documents, so he, he just creates his own signature and sends it to his victim, it will still show the yellow bar. So actually, this really didn't do a lot. <laughs> so you need to go a bit further in the office configuration settings to harden macros. So the thing you should be doing, of course, is to hide the yellow bar. So you can hide the yellow bar in the message bar settings. You just say, well, never show information to the user anymore. And if we look at carefully what's written there, it is the message bar settings. Be careful of the wording on all these user interface things on the, on the setting screen. So we now have this self-signed document, no warnings, no execution. Yes, we are secure. That's what I thought. Then we started poking with file formats. And there are some macro-based file formats that are not seen that often. So we all know our Excel workbooks and our macro workbooks. But who of you ever played around with the XLA or XLAM file formats? These are Excel add-ins, but they're just workbooks and renamed a, a, a slightly different format than, than like, the, 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 the work, like the normal ones. 
And interestingly enough, an unsigned one doesn't show anything. But a self-signed one shows a dialog. So you remember, I blocked out the message bar, but that doesn't say anything about a dialog. <laughs> so, and what's the impact here? If I find something like what that was signed, I can take I can take the contents from the workbook, like if it's a signed workbook, and I can place it in this file format. But that's all outside the file, so I can just transpose signatures from one file format to the other. So with this, I can still get a convincing UI user interface pop-up for the user. So my next attempt to block this one was again go through the test trust settings settings, and I found this one, the add-in configurations. And this one really looks like the one I needed, like blocking add-ins, com, VSTO, and others. Well, this, this is another. This is not com, this is not VSTO, this is another. So it should be blocking, right? So let's so I gave it a trend. I get, and there it was. It is still there. So how do you block this stuff? Yeah, it took a bit of time. It turns out that in the file type settings, you can go to this very user-friendly interface where you can say, well, I want to have add-in files, and then all the other one says, if you open, do not open. So this is the best, most intuitive interface ever. And then it will block stuff. So this is where hardening office already say like, wait, wait a minute, these file types are cool, the XLAMs and the XLAs. All these settings I am changing actually are also changing other security features in office. So like if a file is trusted, this impacts MZ, if it's in a trusted location, MZ doesn't run. So this all intertwingles with security controls happening later on. And these settings are very complex. Companies will fail. So this is the perspective of hardening office macros and coming into your organization. But there are, you also have the, the challenge of signing stuff. And what should I sign? And that is where we started about a year ago. So we started looking at some Microsoft signed documents. About a year ago? we found a pattern, a code, uh, a development pattern, a code pattern which some developers used and then later was signed. That was vulnerable for a hijack. And in this presentation, we're gonna go through four different of those code patterns that are potentially vulnerable. The first one we found was that there is a Microsoft signed add-in an analysis tool pack uh, add-in that would allow you to make various calculations. And this was signed and published by Microsoft. Uh, it was also timestamp signed and it contained a valid signature. So even after the signature expired, it would still be regarded as a valid signature. And this add-in did something interesting. When we looked at it, we saw that there was a reference to NLS32.xll in one of the cells, cell B8. And we were like, that, that's curious. What, what would this add-in XLAM add-in do with an XLL, which is a different file format? So we, we tried a couple of things. What if we put our malicious unsigned uh, XLL in the same folder next to it. Would, it. would it load it? Would it run? And it turned out it did. So for the next exploitation steps in this example, we're gonna use cell B8 and we're gonna change the name. And that is 32.xl to some other stuff. We were interested on how this process, how this happened. How would the VBA code in this add-in load that XLL? So we used our favorite uh, VBA tool, Ole VBA, to extract all the uh, VBA code out of the document. There is an auto open function. So at the moment, the user double clicks the file and sees the notification. Well, 
if Microsoft isn't already added as a trusted publisher, then the code would run. Uh, auto open code runs, it will uh, obtain the XLL name from the XLL name cell and add, obtain the value from the cell. And to reiterate, like uh, macros within documents are only the, only the part is signed of the VBA project pin bin. So everything within a Office document or Office Excel sheet is not signed. So all the worksheets, all the cells, everything is not signed except for the part, the VBA project pin bin part that contains the macro. So this value is obtained from the cell and is later uh, consumed within the register XLL function in a simple concatenation. So let's see if we can abuse it. Let's first look at the normal pattern. Like this is normally used like this. In cell B8, there is the value NLS 32.XLL. But what if we, if we change it? For, for instance, for a phishing scenario, so that uh, there is one file with a cool icon, this XLAM file with a cool green icon, and the other files don't, don't have an icon or are not clickable, which makes our phishing or lateral movement story even easier. If we change it to demo 64 dot, we have another success. So the, the file name and the file extension can be freely manipulated by the attacker. We already suspected this because this is part of the unsigned part of the document. But we still had a bit of a tricky part here because an XLL is a DLL. It's an Excel add-in. But this is not an Excel add-in that is based on VBA code. This is an Excel add-in that is a PE format. It's basically a DLL. So this DLL should have the corresponding bitness of the host process of Excel. So if Excel is 64-bit, then the DLL should also be 64-bit. And if Excel is 32-bit, then the DLL should also be 32-bit. So we needed a way to determine that. And we used like calculations for that. Like with these uh, calculations within the cell, you can determine if the Excel host process is 64-bit or 32-bit and pick your payload accordingly. So how would that look like in, in a quick demo? So suppose we want to fish our victim. We will send a specific uh, type of container format to the victim, like an image or a ISO or a zip in this case, and then the user would receive it and click on it. Once extracted, user will double click the cool document icon that is valid signed. If you, would if you would check more settings, it would show up. This is from Microsoft Corp, officially signed, all the stuff. But a lot Signature of is valid. A lot of companies have that one as a trusted publisher, so they will not see anything and it will just run. And that's where we got shell. And then we get a shell and our, our code runs. We later found more vulnerabilities in this document and we were able to narrow down our, our exploits to only be able to serve one file that would load a remote, from a remote location all the other uh, resources needed to uh, gain remote code execution. So remote load an XLL, for instance, over WebDAV. For more information, uh, you can uh, check the previous presentation on this topic. To recap, Microsoft uh, signed various Excel add-ins. Some of them depended on uh, content within the same document that was in an unsigned part and it was possible from this signed context, after the user accepted it, to load unsigned, potentially malicious resources. This was due to, a uh, to, to multiple reasons. And one of the reasons that we, we abused was we took this single file out of the installation context, out of the C program files, Microsoft Office installation context, 
and placed it somewhere else where it would look for various resources. Uh, to patch and mitigate this issue, Microsoft had to implement various, uh, various things and mitigations. They fixed the input validation. They uh, prevented the signing downgrade. So you can now, from a signed document, no longer load an unsigned XLL unless you set a different registry key. Uh, and they kind of revoked their own uh, previously signed documents with a blacklist because, as you might know, Office does not have a certificate revocation list, which would uh, made the patch more difficult, but they hard-coded it into it what, from what we suspect. But during the patch, Microsoft did more. They patched not only this specific file, they also changed and patched other files. So the problem might be much bigger. And this is where our, our story continued. So what other vulnerable signed files are there? And what other potential uh, insecure coding practices were used there? So let's look for more signed files. You can look for more signed files on the internet. There's plenty of them out there. You can, uh, you can use search engines to find. You can uh, look for file types specifically, XLSM, XLAM, but also the older formats, XLA, XLL. Uh, you can look at Firestotal. There you can also find plenty of them. Uh, but in addition to that, another very important source, if you're performing red team engagement, is to do, local, uh, to do network reconnaissance or local reconnaissance. So if you already have a foothold uh, in a target network, try to look if you can find uh, signed documents published by that, that organization uh, and then download them. Because if you're, for instance, kicked out or if you want to do lateral movement or, or anything, then you can lift on that signature and if you can find a potential bypass or a potential vulnerable vulnerability in the document. And please note that this goes further than just Excel. This also applies to Word, PowerPoint, and the other Microsoft Office, uh, VBA or macro or uh, documents that can be signed. One of the files that we found very interesting was uh, our, our a document, an add-in that was signed, um, and that had more than 60,000 lines of VBA, and it had a lot of potentially suspicious functions. So this is legit. This, this is, is signed, legitimate. This is like an official installer package, and this is what it got. We're like laughing our ass off. It was like, yeah. what is this? What we're now doing and we're looking into. So we were like composing this set of, of, of files we could find on the internet. And in parallel, Microsoft was working, and they were like, can we take a bit more time before you disclose it? Take a bit more time. Then they came with this patch, and, and we suddenly were like, wait a minute. We gave you this XLA file where our vulnerability was in. And then they patched other, other files where we knew that this pattern was not in. And we were like, there are other patterns that, we, that can be abused. So pattern two is about declares and DLL hijacks. So if you look at the issue, what happens with, this, with, with Microsoft's add-in, and in this case, it was the solver add-in, it is very trivial once we start looking into it. So this is the original code, the original VBA code. And I guess this is the point. Oh, this is not the pointer. Can you go back? The top, top one is the pointer. This is the updated one with the CH drive. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, so what this function, what, what this macro does, it is a, a solver function, um, and the macro code, uh, the, the, the top right part says, I'm importing this function solve, uh, and if you use this in the further VBA code, you should then load this function from this solver32 DLL file. And then there's this function solve, 
which is the which has the parameters, which is the, the thing you can call in Excel. So in an Excel file, you can call a function that is defined in VBA. And in that function solve, the Excel function, they do first a change directory to the current application path, uh, to the current worksheet path, and then they call this function solve, which is then loading the DLL. So this is relative, so, so if I take this file out of context, I just place it somewhere and I place this solve32 DLL alongside and I make uh, uh, the file call this solve function in, in, in the Excel file, you'll see that it's changing directory to the current directory and it's immediately then loading this function from the DLL. So the only thing we need to do is build a DLL that has this solve function or an auto uh, and, and, and we get this load event and we can run on malware with it. So once we saw this one, we're like, wow, we missed this one. We were really, really bad hackers. <laughs> um, and then we started looking at all the other files that we had because we just collected a lot of other signed files. And well, not all of them are as nice as this Microsoft sample because they don't typically change directory to the current, current path. So, so we were playing with it um, and we're, had, we're, having, we're having some issues with it. Because if we looked at what was happening, any time and again, uh, the office applications would be looking in the documents folder. They never looked in the current part. Be but there, the DLL, it, is, uh, it should be behaving according to a regular load image, which says, well, current application, current path it should check. So what's happening here? Why is it always looking in the documents folder and not like in my ISO or in my in my folder, which I just created from the zip. Well, it turned out there are some features in Excel that I even didn't know, uh, know about. So Excel always starts with a path of the documents folder. And you can manipulate this with a setting. There's this default file location. And you can manipulate it in a configuration, but as far as I know, you cannot manipulate this in like with a file itself, like providing an Excel sheet that changes this path. So there are two ways how we can abuse this. If we have these declares, then what we can do is we can send, take this file out of context and we can tell the user, dear user, this file only works in the documents folder. Please copy it there. We just social engineer him saying, place it in the documents folder. That makes sense, right? You can convince people. An alternative would be a more technical approach you can make an LNK file, and the LNK file in the parameters, it can tell to Excel which should be this environmental path where it's looking. So, another coding pattern. Uh, this is about declares, taking the files out of context, and where does the declare load stuff from? What Microsoft did in their patch is they first check where is actually the current, the current path, then they change directory to the application part of Excel, and then after, then they load the the, the, the DLL, and then they change uh, Excel back to the path where it should be, just to mitigate this this one thing. And I guess anybody using declares in VBA code and code signing should use these kind of patterns. So this was pattern two, and we had this set of of signed files, and we were looking like what other things are there that can, where it can go wrong. And then we stumbled up another gem where uh, one, Excel, uh, one Excel file was calling application.run on another Excel, uh, XLAM file. And it turns out that once the first file is signed, then the macro engine starts running. And anything that the first file loads is no longer checked whether it's signed or whether it's ac according to the trusted publishers, etc. So you have this one file you take from like an installer, you place your other file alongside, send it out, and there you go. You're fishing now with like the signatures signed by like the big vendors, etc. So really cool stuff. Application not run. Well, yeah, who's using this? It's a bit of a, a bit a bit of a strange thing. What actually happens if just a Excel file is opening another Excel file? 
will it transpose this trust of like I checked I checked the signature first and now I'm opening another macro enabled file. Will it trans will it will it forward the trust? Yes, it will. So any VBA code that opens another workbook and where, where it's signed, you can just all take the signature, use it to your benefit, and then, then take a step further. Then you start looking on Stack Overflow, what are people doing with macros, and you're like, well, you're getting like a world like Excel opening Word, Word opening Excel, and you're like, how big is this actually? And can you secure against this? Uh, a lot of questions, and, and we played around with things. So, the run function just always runs macros. The document open always also seems to be forwarding the trust of of, macro, of the macro engine. But if you add a document to an application, it suddenly is not. So, I'm not sure what the difference is between adding a document and opening it. But it apparently is a difference in the sense of the document you add is not automatically executed. Another pattern that you could try to do is like can I although I'm running the macro engine can I block the macros for the other file I'm opening um, and actually you can for a bit so the thing is you can disable the events so there is a feature uh, a property of the application objects where you can say as a developer I don't. I, I want to enable events. I set that to false, and then I load my other file. And if you do that, then things like auto open are no longer available in the application. You just disabled like the auto open, the workbook open, and you think you're a bit sa a bit safer. But this is relatively subtle, because yes, you can disable the main events. But if I, as an attacker, somehow can trigger an Excel file to recalculate, well, a recalculation in Excel, in a file that where the macro engine is somehow activated, it can be patterns like, I just call a function that's defined in VBA. And again, we have our code execution. So if you're a developer or you're, if you're involved in code signing, be very careful on one file opening another file because this is very subtle and it really relates to each other. So these are three categories. The fourth pattern that we located is for Dima. The fourth pattern that we located was not originating from VBA. It was originating from XLLs, from this PE file format. So just like any regular DLL, an XLL can also just add other libraries and import them uh, from the system32 directory, for instance, but also from the local installation there. So if you have a big installer that would install all various add-ins in, for instance, uh, program files, you can also reference them from, from there because the current directory is result. So th this is an example, this screenshot from a signed XLL that we found publicly. And this uh, XLL loads three different DLLs from the import address table using the import address table that are not in system32. They are, they are normally locally installed, but now we can see if we can abuse this. This, this code pattern, if you can abuse this uh, using out of context execution. So what happens if we take this XLL out of the installation context and send it to another user? Will that XLL or will Excel as the host process see the XLL, see the import address table and start loading these DLLs? And actually it turned out it does. So it will start looking for those DLLs, not only in the regular uh, installation directories, but also in the current directory. Even though Excel already changed the current directory to the documents folder, it will still look in the current directory where the XLL is located. So for instance, downloads or documents. And that's interesting. And it's something we can work with. What you also see here is that an XLL, 
uh, doesn't give a yellow bar as a warning, but it gives also this really nice, interesting pop-up box. So let's try to exploit this. In our initial attempts, our exploitation uh, actually failed. Like somehow we, we weren't able to get it to work and uh, we get this, uh, this message, like the file format and extension don't match. And uh, like it, 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 it stopped opening it. And this is the message we usually would get with XLLs if we used an XLL that was not the same bitness as the host uh, application, Excel. So if you use a 32-bit XLL on a 64-bit Excel, or a 64-bit XLL on a 32-bit Excel uh, application. So we were like a bit confused, but it turned out that if Excel is unable to resolve all the functions from the, the DLLs that were defined in the import address table, then it would also give this. So to make your exploit fully working, you need to uh, make sure that Excel will be able to resolve all the functions that are defined in the import address table. And one of the ways you can do that easily is using function proxying, which you can automate parts of using this project. So how would a practical exploitation look like? You would serve uh, a user, for instance, a container, uh, image, ISO, whatever, with the cool clickable file with a nice icon uh, and a bunch of DLLs. Like uh, some of them just the normal legitimate ones, but one you forward to uh, one that is, has another name, for instance, underscore ori.dll. And then once the user double clicks the XLL, everything will be loaded after the user also <laughs> confirms the security warning and we get a shell code execution. Mitigations also in this case are basically the same as for any DLL ghosting or DLL hijacking attack. So uh, you can specify the full path, the full installation path, well, if that is always the same for your, your installation or for your add-in. But otherwise, you can also set different linker options. So linker options to look at a specific application directory or to always require a signed DLL so that this XLL will only load signed DLLs or this DLL has to be signed. Uh, you can also uh, set the search or the default DLL directories uh, and change the search order to not look at the current directory, for instance. Um, and you have to do that before the, the load library calls, or you can set uh, delay load uh, import uh, linker instruction. For more information, link in the description. To summarize, in our research, we have found four different common vulnerable coding patterns. Uh, we found them not only at Microsoft, but at also uh, other vendors that are uh, publishing publicly accessible uh, add-ins and macros and whatnot. And we've also found these coding practices uh, in public code, Gitter projects, and Stack Overflow. Added to that, um, if, you're go if, if you would encounter an uh, internal environment, internal company environment, you could potentially find a combination of any of these. So, what should we be doing with this? Well, for the defenders in the room, office security settings are complex. I am really not sure who makes the user interface there, but he is a full brain mismatch with mine, but I consider them complex. We got these lol docs files where we take files out of context in the office world and then suddenly they do something different than what we intended. So what we do with this? Well, we probably want to reconsider your trusted publishers because we've shown you a lot of prompts where, the, the, where like it's just shown a prompt. Some of our companies have like 10 parties they trust, like all the big, the big name vendors, and we got a couple of them that would certainly fly through. So there will be no warning. So consider whom you trust. 
If you are yourself in the process of signing macros, do a code review. We have shown, shown you four, four patterns you should avoid. There may be more in the future, but at least avoid these four. And then there's a challenge. I mean, you can have these signatures timestamp time signs where this, the, the signature will remain valid after expiration of the certificate, which makes life easier in terms of life cycle. But yes, how do we ever revoke these files? So really make that balance, that balance very deliberate. Because these files, they're now out there. If someone stole them, you can't do anything on it anymore. From the offensive viewpoint, well, there are many of these files. We just started the hunt. We are certainly not complete. And revoking these files is hard. So once you have your hands on it, they can hardly take it away. This is cool. And they actually, because this is a trusted file for a lot of companies, it's already bypassing MZ, so it brings us a lot of value in that, in that sense. So if you're in an operation and you are just landed on the workstation and you're like, this looks like very much secure, high secure environment, they have all the security monitoring in place, just check what the trusted publishers are. If they have like this internal trusted publisher, just download all the documents that are signed that, that have macros in it and start analyzing it offline. And if you have something, well, initial access, lateral movement, it can also serve as long-term persistence, they can't revoke it. So a lot of goodies for us. So for us, we consider Office the product that keeps on giving. <laughs> so thank you. That's all, folks. <laughs> So, questions on this? All in for the beers, <laughs> the party. <laughs> yeah, I will. The, so I'm, can you rephrase the question once more? Because I, I somewhere missed it on the GPO part. So, so the question is whether the settings I showed in the GUI, whether you can also do this like on a corporate level with group policies. Uh, as far as I know, yes, you can control all these things with group policies and there are some things you can control with group policies which you can't do in the user interface. So you should be able to at least have these basics done uh, on the uh, with the group policies. I think this file block setting thing, uh, that is a, a complex beast with group policies, uh, but it, it, sh it should be doable. At least I know clients that, customers of us that did that at, at scale, so it can be done. Good question. So question is, is the mark of the web file blocking affecting this and to what extent is it affecting it? Yes, so mark of the web still applies on all these files. So that's where in the introduction I also said, this is not only about phishing. Because if you are inside, there is no mark of the web. So you can, that, that still works. But yes, you still have to use your, uh, your magic to, get by, to bypass mark of the web if you want to pull this off as an initial entry method. Towards the end, recommended setting timestamps, which, if I understood correctly, may not be effective because some of these signatures never expire. Was that? So the thing is, you, so when you sign files, there is an option. So to, 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 to explain this a bit, you can sign a file now, but the certificate is only valid for one year. So what do you want to happen after the year? It's a choice you can make. You can do two things. You can say, after a year, I need to re-sign. 
or I now ask for the official time. I prove the time. I prove that the certificate was valid now, and then I sign it now. So then I have a proof that one at the moment I signed it, that I was valid, so it will be valid indefinite. So in that sense, it is more a matter of strategy. Do you want to re-sign your files every year? Or do you want to create these files that are ones uh, that, that if one is vulnerable, it is indefinitely vulnerable? This is a balance to be made. So we cannot say which one to take, but it is yeah, like both ends are having their pros and cons. So the question is, is this also working on the SharePoint web exec? Uh, I, as far as I know, that doesn't have a VBA macro engine. They have these JavaScript add-ins only that they support, but we didn't look deep into that into, into that uh, that field. So fully in the back. So that's a, that's a long walk. <laughs> <laughs> Are you also able to uh, add to the blacklist as a company, or is only Microsoft able to add to that list as a revocation uh, method? So yeah. that is a very interesting question, which we will explore the upcoming ones with the uh, submissions, etc. What what will be going on there? Uh, we don't know. We we didn't identify a blacklist. We just kind of guessed there is one because that's the only way how they could do it. Uh, so, this is also future work for us to like locate where it is in Excel, whether there's like really like a date where it needs to be signed after, and whether that is something that, yeah, whether it will be a problem that will really fix with like a block list. I don't know. I don't know. Thanks. Going once, going twice. Thanks very much. Thank you.